In today's video, we're taking a look at the recent reports that suggest Timo Meyer of the Sharks could be a prime target for the Toronto Maple Leafs. We're also going to take a look at a little additional further information on what might happen next in Vancouver as well as on Long Island with the Islanders. We also have some talk around the New Jersey Devils, more talk around the Sharks, Kings, Capitals, Senators as well. Plus, we have news in the NHLPA's new leader uh, and some other news regarding some injuries around the league. All that coming up next. So welcome back to another video here at Top Shelf Hockey. As I mentioned, we have a variety of initial news and some trade talk to take a look at today. Uh, first up, we got some news uh, earlier today regarding former Florida Panther head coach and current associate coach with the Devils, Andrew Brunette. Apparently, he's been arrested on a DUI in the state of Florida. So this is certainly not a good scenario, not something you want to see. Obviously, at this point, I haven't seen comments from the NHL or the Devils right now. I'm not sure if they have put out a statement. I haven't seen it. Uh, so I'm sure they're aware of it, though, for sure, given the amount of time here um, that has passed since this first became news earlier today. Uh, so certainly not a good scenario. I don't know if this is going to affect him in any way when it comes to his employment, the doubles or whatnot. I think they'll probably take a little bit of time to see what comes from it, but uh, certainly not a good look. So certainly I uh, hope if he's dealing with anything that caused this to happen that, you know, that he can move forward here, but certainly not a good scene for the former Panthers head coach. Uh, it sounds as well like we're also getting closer, but it's hard to say exactly how close to a new leader being named for the National Hockey League's Players Association for their union. Uh, at this point, uh, there's gonna be meetings held over the All-Star break. Um, right now, we get word today from Darren Dreger of TSN indicating that the, um, the new executive director could possibly end up being Marty Walsh. Now, he's a current U.S. Secretary of Labor, so has a political background. Uh, he's believed to be the, the top candidate uh, right now. But, of course, says because of the, being a Secretary of Labor, he does have a, a big background in, in the union world, which obviously they're a union. So uh, it sounds like he's had a chance to meet with the search committee that's been in place to help find a new leader and that they seem to be quite pleased. Uh, ultimately, before a new leader can be named for the Players Association, uh, they have to put it to a, a, a vote, and they need, I believe it's 18 out of 32 votes. So each team has their representative on the board, and uh, they all vote, and they have to have a majority vote of at least 18 votes. So um, I'm not sure if that is going to end up taking place at the meetings that are going to occur this coming weekend at the All-Star festivities, but uh, it could. Uh, we'll have to wait and see. Other name that was that I mentioned has been rumored to be in the mix is Mike Gillis, but it wouldn't be shocking if it is somebody who doesn't necessarily have a hockey background that's more you know union based, like Marty Walsh is, just like Don Fair, of course, came from um, MLB. Um, obviously, they don't necessarily have to be connected to the sport. It's more about the business side and the union side. So we'll see what they decide to do and who they decide to uh, kind of basically elect as the new executive director of the PA, but that's likely going to be decided here in the not too distant future. Uh, we get a variety of uh, updates for, for roster moves, mostly because of the all-star break. A lot of younger players and rookies and prospects being reassigned to their American Hockey League affiliates so that they can continue to play and don't have such a long extended break. Uh, but the LA Kings return Alex Turcott and T Toby Bjornfort and Samuel Fangimo back to their American Hockey League affiliate. I know the Ottawa Senators also have sent down uh, a few players, including Mark Costella, Lee Gregg, and Mad Sogard, who was recently just called up on an emergency basis. So they're all back down to the American Hockey League. I believe with Ridley Gregg, I don't think he's actually going to suit up and play American Hockey League games, but he is going to be with the American Hockey League team and, and do practices with them, I guess. I'm not really sure what the point of that is. I guess it keeps him on the ice, keeps him sharp, but at the same time, maybe they don't want to risk getting him injured because he's becoming a big part of the Sens uh, top six in his brief time so far since his call up. I would be pretty surprised if he doesn't remain in Ottawa for the remainder of the season, unless things, you know, obviously change pretty drastically on that front. Several other players, of course, are likely going to get demoted in the next day or so as teams wrap up their final games here. Before the All-Star break, we have to only have two games tonight, and then the break uh, gets underway tomorrow. Uh, bad news out of Columbus. We found out today that uh, Gus Nyquist of the Columbus Blue Jackets, who has been out injured, and was uh, we knew it was going to be a longer-term thing, but now they're saying that he's done for the season, and he's a pending unrestricted free agent. So it was bad for him, 
obviously from a business perspective he didn't want to have to miss so much time this year when he's uh, you know on an expiring contract it's tough sometimes to get a new contract when you didn't play much the year before uh obviously you know when you're getting a little bit older you're, you're uh your your age is creeping up. Your you know your play's probably declining a, a bit, and, and then you start running into these injuries. It's not good for your career, and at the same time, it's bad for the team because I know he was a player that was being reported back before the injury that a lot of teams were kind of keeping an eye on and were interested to in possibly acquiring before the deadline as a as a rental player. So unfortunate news there out of Columbus. They won't be able to get any assets. He won't be able to keep playing to impress teams for a contract for next year and beyond. So. That's certainly not good news at all. On the trade front, we have a variety of things I want to look at. First up, I noticed on Insider Trading uh, on TSN, and a few other outlets have been talking about it too. They've been mentioning Alex DeBrinkin. I know on last night's telecast of the Sens and Habs, they talked about it on a couple different divisions, or, or intermission, sorry, saying that DeBrinkin, uh, you know, because Ottawa hasn't extended him yet, that they're wondering if a potential trade at the deadline, which makes absolutely no sense to me. For one, he's not a UFA. Uh, he's a pending restricted free agent. Uh, I know some have said the season hasn't gone well for him, but it actually has. Like, yes, he's only on pace for closer to 30 goals uh, when he is former 40-goal guy, but he's getting a lot more assists. Like, his point totals are good. Uh, his overall play is good. Uh, currently, his line with Claude Giroux and Ridley Gregg has been very hot here going into the All-Star break. Um, so I don't, I don't think there's any issues that way at all. I honestly wonder if, you know, they just wanted to wait uh, before getting an extension done. There was talk early in the year that they were having discussions, and I'm sure that was legit and actually taking place. But you got to remember, like, he played in Chicago for the first number of years. He's still in his first season. I'm sure he wanted to take some time, see how things went, get used to his teammates, get used to the coaches, get used to the city and all that before he wants to commit long-term. So to me, I know there's some talk out there that if he's not signed, maybe they trade him. But to me, it doesn't make any sense. There's no reason why they can't afford to bring it as well as what else they have in um, you know, trying to find an elusive defense when they want to add to the mix here. So especially going into the All-Star break, on a four-game winning streak, they've made up some ground in the playoffs. They're still obviously on the outside looking in. They're six points out of a wild card spot. So to me, I, I don't see them doing it. Doesn't make any sense after what they gave up for him, and he's a young, you know, important piece to their future. Why they would just trade him and not sign him? But they, he seems to be getting some mention uh, in the rumor mill. And personally, I'm not really sure there's really anything to that, but time will tell. Uh, with Vancouver and the New York Islanders, of course, we saw a big trade with Mo Horvat being involved. Uh, now it's being suggested that, which, which we really shouldn't be surprised here. We talked yesterday about what's coming next. Uh, and Brock Besser's name is getting a lot more attention as well. Uh, we talked mostly about Demko yesterday, but reports have indicated from uh, NHL insiders that there's about six or seven teams that are very interested in Besser. This was another topic on TSN's insider trading in last night's segment. And ultimately, the big issue that seems to be holding things up from finding a good deal for Brock Besser is that teams that have been inquiring with Vancouver want them to retain salary. Uh, obviously, he signed a three-year contract in the offseason, and really so far his struggle is going to show that he's not really living up to the cap hit. So teams are interested because they've seen what he can do before. Uh, they obviously want to bring that potential back out in him if they acquire him. They want to see that, you know, that more of the goal-scoring winger that the, the Canucks thought they had as well. And obviously, you know, that's tough when you're not producing – with the contract. So Vancouver basically sounds like from what uh, they're saying on insider trading is that they've told teams that uh, we'll consider it, give us your best offers and uh, we'll see what we can do. So it doesn't seem completely out of the realm of possibilities here that Vancouver will retain. Doesn't mean they will for sure either, but they'll certainly take a look at it depending on what the offer is. I think if you want them to retain, which is always a standard business practice, when you see a team retaining salary, they're usually doing that for one, to make sure that the deal can happen. But secondly, they know that that's extra leverage to ask for more of a return. So if they return, uh, retain versus not retaining, that increases things for sure. But at the same time, salary cap flexibility is at a premium. And sometimes it's not worth having um, you know more money tied up just to get an extra second or third round pick, which a player that may not even ever play. And if they do, you're probably looking at three or four years down the road. So you have to value that accordingly and kind of weigh everything at will here, but uh, but Besser's getting lots of attention. It's the contract that's holding things up. So if Vancouver's willing to retain, we might see something uh, before the deadline. But I know there's a lot of talk. He could be the next big one. I think a Demco trade is quite likely as well. I'm not sure that that's as 
um, you know, as likely to happen before the deadline. Of course, Luke Shen's another one to watch, but again, not for certain that he goes. It's possible Vancouver signs him, but it just really boils down to what the uh, offers are on him. Now, we could also see a trade between the Washington Capitals and the Los Angeles Kings. I saw some articles today suggesting that these two teams are linked, and it does make sense. Uh, the Washington Capitals have had a lot of injuries on the blue line and are going to be without top defenseman John Carlson for the remainder of the regular seasons, but it looks like um, so they can really use some help on the back end. Now, a veteran forward that they've been uh, rumored to be willing to part with for some time, because I mentioned this before, Lars Eller is available for trade by the Washington Capitals. And if they can work him into a deal that brings a defenseman to Washington, that would be a preferable type of trade that they would be happy to do. So obviously the LA Kings have multiple defensemen, uh, like uh, Sean Walker and Matt Roy, uh, both right shot D, uh, not on big contracts or not, you know, obviously long terms or anything of that nature. We're not talking like, you know, the big names on, on some of these big deals, but obviously having Carlson's contract in LTIR will be beneficial when the time is needed. But certainly, uh, you know, Walker and Roy for Eller may not be a one-for-one -one deal. I, I don't think Lars Eller, to be honest, has a ton of real uh, leverage or, like, you know, value per se. But I know he's an extra veteran guy who can play a, a two-way game that the LA Kings might be wanting to add to their bottom six. But at the same time, they have guys like Kopitar and Deneau. And I'm not convinced that that's a perfect fit. Um, but it very well could be a case where... Maybe we see separate deals. I can see the Capitals having interest in the defenseman in L.A. that's available. I just don't know that Eller would be the one that they would be willing to take back. But we'll see. Other teams have been reportedly looking at L.A.'s defenseman too. And so far, nobody's pulled the trigger. So we'll have to see where that goes. Uh, on to another potential trade that we might see involving the New York Islanders. As I mentioned, of course, Brock Bester, Thatcher Demko, Luke Schinner, guys getting mentioned as far what's next for Vancouver. But now that Horvat's in Long Island... A name that's come up by Elliot Friedman that we could see traded could actually be Jean-Gabriel Pajot. He wonders now that they have all these players who are capable of playing center, if maybe a Pajot deal might be something the Islanders look to do to give them some more flexibility. Obviously, having Horvat and extending him is going to be extremely important. Um, you know, they have uh, other guys who can play center. They can either go with Horvat Barzell as the centers, or maybe Barzell plays wing with Horvat. They also have Brock Nelson who can play center. Pajot typically is the number three center. He does see some power play time, uh, and I believe he has the most power play goals on the team this year. So for right now, he's somebody who's you know uh, contributing to a, a, an anemic weak offense, which is certainly why they acquired Horvat. But at the same time, from a cap perspective, you know you gotta wonder if that Pajot contract is not exactly. You know, something I don't think they're as thrilled with. I think they wish they'd see more out of him to justify that cap hit. Not that he's been bad, but he could be more offensive. But you could say that about a lot of the team. So it's not like it's entirely all on him. Uh, the whole team could be better offensively. But the name that came up in uh, Friedman's uh, podcast was the Carolina Hurricanes. Maybe he's, you know, he sees uh, the Hurricanes being a great fit for Pajot. And he and Jeff Merrick both preferred to... Uh, Pajot as being a prototypical Rod Brindamore type of player. Uh, Pajot is very tenacious. He's hardworking. Uh, you know, just that, that hard workmanship is something that we know Brindamore obviously values. At the same time, he's a great penalty killer. He's dangerous shorthanded. Uh, good on faceoffs. There's lots to like about Pajot, and he's shown this year he can be effective on the power play too. We know Carolina likely does want to add, given the fact that Pacioretty's out. They have some flexibility with the LTIR. Uh, possibilities with their salary cap situation, and it wouldn't hurt if they added somebody with, you know, a, you know, uh, some offensive abilities. Pajot is not exactly, you know, the most offensive, but he's certainly a good two-way player, so it could be a good fit there to kind of shore up that middle six. Obviously, Freeman didn't have any information to suggest that Canes were going after Pajot, but he can see that as a potential trade that might follow the uh, the acquisition of Horvat. So you have to wonder what we'll see there. It'd be interesting to see how Lou proceeds now to fill out the rest of his roster and other moves that might come. We know that they would like to add on the blue line as well, and they may want to add another forward. And to do that, they're going to need some more salary to go out besides what they moved out in Anthony Beauvillier. But there is word, like I said yesterday, that guys like Clutterbuck and Wallstrom are likely done for the season. They might have some wiggle room with LTIR to be able to you know spend above the cap and to kind of get all his fit in 
to be cap compliant. I also want to talk about Timo Meyer and San Jose. They've often been linked to the New Jersey Devils, but there's certainly more uh, than them that's been linked here. Of course, Elliot Friedman talked recently how the Devils are certainly a team that's been in the mix, but he's not sure he would call them the front runner. He's also linked them, linked him to the Toronto Maple Leafs, citing the fact that the Leafs uh, certainly want to make additions. We know that. Uh, it's believed that the forward area is their primary area of concern. Now, when it comes to the Devils, we know Tom Fitzgerald has made it known publicly that he wants to add a top six forward. And Timo Meyer is certainly prototypical of what they would want. He can play a power forward type of role. He's not overly old. He's a great goal scorer. There's lots to like there and certainly would be argued to say that he can be a good fit with a lot of clubs that are striving to be playoff teams and cup contenders this year. Uh, one hurdle, though, that Friedman sees the Devils having with Timo Meyer is the potential contract, uh, so that they don't have him strictly as a rental player. Uh, of course, he's due a $10 million qualifying offer. It's believed they might be able to get him signed on a longer-term deal under $10 million, but there's no guarantee that that's going to be the case. He has the leverage, and he can force his way into that one-year $10 million deal if he really, really wants to. Of course, that's why that's in that contract. He can play that card and do what he likes. At the same time, if he's willing to take, you know, eight, eight and a half, nine million or whatever it is that he wants on a long-term deal and he'll sign, then that's great too. But New Jersey, reportedly, according to Friedman, isn't crazy about any of the other forwards making more than Jack Hughes, which of course is eight million bucks. You know, it doesn't say it's a hard and fast rule that nobody can make more than Hughes, but it's certainly something that they want to kind of use as a baseline for their high end of things for their top players. Maybe a little more than eight, but not much, that's for sure. Whereas, you know, obviously he's got a $10 million qualifying offer. I've, from what we've heard from other reports, it sounds like he's going to want at least nine. And to be honest, based on the numbers, what he can do, I think he's actually worth that kind of money anyway. So it's not like he's being greedy here. It's just a matter of what a matter of what teams can afford. Now, from a Leaf perspective, they would not acquire Meyer the expectation that they'd sign him to an extension for the Leafs would be a pure rental so if the teams can't you know find an extension uh, or work that out ahead of time because we know that the Sharks appear that they're okay to let him negotiate with the next team that he's going to be dealt to to work that out so it is possible he could be traded and then immediately signed shortly thereafter so that's a possibility that we might see now of course with the Maple Leafs that certainly would not be what we'd see at all he said even if the Leafs have to give up you know three assets which is the rumored asking price you're looking at a couple of young players so like a first round pick a, a top young prospect and then or two b-level prospects and then probably a younger ish roster player that's uh you know obviously able to help from the financial side on a team a player that can go on the team obviously help the sharks now so like i said you're looking at first round pick Maybe a prospect, whether it's Robertson, Nyes, or something comparable. And then you're also looking at, um, you know, maybe a guy like whether it's got like Kerfoot or Engvall or one of those types of players that are still, you know, on the younger side of things, not making a ton of money, but can get some money off the books to, uh, to help with the cap. The Sharks could retain half of Myers' con uh, contract, which is certainly going to make the cap hit for the current year not all that bad right so the Leafs could do it now the rationale behind this according to Elliot Friedman is when they do this knowing that they can't sign him is that after the season's over they could trade him to recoup you know maybe not everything but certainly recoup a chunk of what they gave up so maybe they trade him and they try to get a first round pick and a prospect back well then maybe they basically rented him for the, the difference in what they gave up versus what they get back, right? So it may not be too bad if they do it that way, but they are running some risk on what the return packages are going to be. Teams are going to know that the Leafs are what they're doing, and they're probably not going to be overly willing to uh, to play ball. If teams refuse to trade with Toronto, then they might be forced to not qualify him, and if he becomes a UFA and walks, then they certainly don't get those assets back. So to be honest... It is a potential strategy the Leafs could do, and it could work very, very well if they could work that out. But if the rest of the NHL teams want to play hardball with them and really give them a run here, then they could not make a trade and force them to let him go for nothing. That's a real risk they run. So I tell and advise them to be quite careful on how they do things here. But at the end of the day, they want to win the Stanley Cup, and if they accomplish that, they're not going to care too much one way or the other but certainly the Leafs are a team to watch when it comes to Meyer the Devils are another team that's in the mix and there's others too but certainly makes a lot of sense that he could be very well used as a rental which is not really a traditional thing given the fact he's a pending restricted free agent 
That is all of your news and rumors here for today. So certainly let me know your thoughts down in the comments. We'll discuss further. If you're new to the channel, of course, make sure you subscribe and stick around. We'll keep you up to date with the latest news, rumors, and analysis of all 32 NHL teams. Thank you for watching, and I will catch you next time.